So this is the start of your chapter eight video lectures. Uh, lectures or material that you've already wanted to have covered is um, going through section 8.1 in your book, as well as <clears throat> reading through the written lecture um, online for section 8.2, and that covers both uh, electrolytes and non-electrolytes, as well as equivalents. Okay. So chapter 8 is dealing with solutions. And hopefully by going through your pre-lecture worksheet, as well as section 8.1, um, looking at examples of what solutions are, you've realized that um, solutions can come in all three phases. So we can have gas solutions, like air. Um, we can have solid solutions, a lot of your alloy metals. Those are combinations. They are solutions of metals. Um, and also liquid solutions. Now, most of the time, um, we, we think of solutions as being in the liquid phase. Um, and part of the reason for that is most of the solutions that we're going to be looking at and using are going to be in the liquid phase because we're going to use water as our solvent for the most part. And so um, just keep in mind, you know, in the back of your mind that Solutions can come in all three phases, um, but most of the time we're going to be thinking about solutions usually in the liquid phase. So we are talking about solutions, so we're going to be talking about solvents and solutes. We're going to be dissolving uh, solutes into usually solvents, again, usually water. Whenever we talk about um, dissolving things, we need to talk about solubility. So our definition for solubility is this is the amount of solute that can dissolve in a given amount of solvent. And depending on what your solute and your solvent are, that the, the solubility, this amount okay, that you can dissolve, it's going to vary from compound to compound. Now, when we have solutions that have, have a certain amount of solute in them, okay, we have kind of three different uh, varia varies, that's not the word I want, kind of variations of solubility, three different um, classifications or levels um, or kind of another term would be three degrees of saturation. And again, these are just kind of ways to describe a solution. The first kind of degree or level of saturation is an unsaturated solution. And this is where we have less than the maximum amount of solute dissolved. So if we were to add more solute to an unsaturated solution, we could get that solute to dissolve.
All right. If we have an unsaturated solution and we continue to add solute until we get just the right amount of solute dissolved for its solubility, okay, so we couldn't add any more, that's where we call that a saturated solution. So one of the ways that we can tell the difference between an unsaturated and a saturated solution is if we added solute to our unknown solution. If the solute dissolved, then we had an unsaturated solution. If the solute does not dissolve, then we have a saturated solution. Now there are ways that we can manipulate <coughs> our saturation and that sometimes we can get more than the maximum amount of solute dissolved. Okay, we can kind of uh, manipulate or trick um, our solution into dissolving more solute than it should handle. And we call this a supersaturated solution. So in a supersaturated solution, if we add more solute, okay, that solute won't dissolve. But what makes it different than a saturated solution is that added solute that you add doesn't dissolve, but it's going to disturb this supersaturation. Okay, it's, a, it's a highly unstable um, solution most of the time. So any type of disturbance, um, say adding more solute, or sometimes just simply bumping um, or moving that solution, what happens is um, that extra amount of solute will uh, do what we call crash out of solution. Okay? Or um, basically what will happen is it will become undissolved. Um, so one of the things that I like to think about kind of with these degrees of saturation is if you think about making a, a simple syrup solution. Um, so if you take sugar and you dissolve it in water, okay, you start out with an unsaturated solution, okay, and then you stir and stir and stir and stir, and you add enough sugar so that you have a saturated solution. Now, one of the ways you can manipulate a sugar solution to become super saturated is by heating it. So if you've ever made, uh, say, hummingbird food, 
um, from scratch, not from the powder mix that you buy, but just making a uh, sugar water solution. You make a super saturated solution by heating it up on the stove. You can get more sugar to dissolve, then you cool it back down. Okay. Once it's cooled back down, that's when you have a super saturated solution. So if you were to add more sugar to that solution, say if you added you know, a teaspoon of it to the solution, you would get not only that teaspoon of, of sugar at the bottom of your solution, but you'd have a higher volume of that sugar okay? because you'd crash out some of that extra amount. So your teaspoon that went in will actually have a larger than teaspoon, say, at the bottom of your container. Okay? And that's what happens with super saturated solutions. All right. So we have our three different kind of degrees of saturation dealing with solubility. Okay? Um, in addition to these degrees of saturation, we can change solubility of uh, compounds because solubility depends on a number of different factors. So solubility is going to depend on temperature. I kind of use that as an example to discuss this super saturation. Okay. Temperature is going to have a different effect on uh, solid solutes. For example, your sugar that we talked about above. It's going to have a different effect on gas solutes. So we'll talk about this momentarily. Um, but an example of this would be, say, carbon dioxide in your carbonated beverages. Mm -hmm. So temperature is going to affect those two differently. Um, another thing that your solubility is going to depend on is the presence of other solutes or contaminants. Sometimes the water that you're using isn't necessarily pure. Um, <clears throat> if you have multiple solutes, they may actually interact with each other, which will affect your solubility. Um, for the most part, we're not really going to um, discuss this. And part of the reason for that is this is a very complicated um, concept here that deals with a lot of different chemical concepts. Um, and it's kind of um, a, a gray area, black magic. Um, some The rules don't always apply all the time, and you have to figure out which rule applies. And it gets complicated very fast. So we're not really going to discuss um, that dependency on solubility. Okay. Um, two, well, uh, one more that we are going to discuss is the type of solute. as well as the type of solvent. <clears throat> type of solute shouldn't be too much of a surprise because basically if we're dealing with a different compound, each compound have, uh, each chemical compounds have their own set of characteristics. So solubility um, is just one of those characteristics. Um, we are going to discuss some of these, the types of solutes and their solubility. Um, and we're actually going to find out that um, solutes don't follow by any rules, um, any type of general um, trends that we try and describe. Um, there are just too many exceptions to make them reasonable. Um, so what we have developed as chemists is we have this list of solubility rules 
and we'll discuss those in the next video. Um, those are kind of uh, more like guidelines, and okay? they're not always followed, but um, we have to have something to grasp onto. Um, another thing about the type of solute, how um, its solubility works, also depends on the type of electrolyte. So electrolytes were already discussed in your online written lecture, um, the actual written out one, not section 8.1, but 8.2. So you have your non-electrolytes, weak electrolytes, and strong electrolytes. That's going to affect your solubility. Type of solvent, if we were to change the solvents, that's going to change our solubility. Um, this we're going to keep constant for the most part. We're not going to change, we're pretty much going to use water in its liquid phase. Okay. Sometimes we're going to look at other examples um, just here and there, but, but for the majority of this section we're going to be talking about water as our solvent. And then our interaction between the solute and the solvent in our solution. How well do the two or more components get along? Which shouldn't be too much of a stretch. Um, and basically how we're going to address this is looking at our solubility rules. Your book also talks about this um, concept of likes dissolves likes. Which uh, I'm not saying is not true, um, but we didn't really get too much into polarity when we talked about chapter five. We did talk about polar versus nonpolar. Um, but it gets a little bit more complicated when we start drawing structures out. Um, and we didn't cover that, and we're not going to cover that. Um, so this argument of likes dissolves likes is a little uh, too complicated for us to, to be able to discuss without the, the concepts of three-dimensional molecules. So um, pretty much it's there, but we're going to be concentrating on our solubility rules. So, we have our different types of dependencies for our solubility. Okay. Solubility rules are what we're going to discuss in the next video. Um, type of solvent, we're going to keep constant at water. We're not going to discuss this one. So, in the remainder of this video, I want to talk about temperature effects and how it's different on our solid solutes versus our gas solutes. So let's look at solubility and temperature. So this is still section eight point three. But this is kind of an introduction to solubility, and now I want to get into some more specifics. So I would separate in my notes. You can do whatever you would like, you know, whatever works for you. So let's look at our solid solutes. So kind of the example that we've been working with, or at least discussing so much, is um, say sugar. So example, and dissolving sugar. And rather than just talking about a simple syrup solution, the, the comparison that I like to do is dissolving sugar in hot tea versus cold tea. Okay, which one is easier? Is it easier to dissolve sugar in hot tea or cold tea? Okay, or iced tea? Well, I don't know about you, but in my experience, whenever I have iced tea and I put, you know, 
packet of sugar in there when I'm at the restaurant. I feel like I have to sit there and stir 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 and stir, and stir, and stir some more. And then I stop stirring and basically all the sugar falls down to the bottom. And that's pretty much as far as I can get. Okay. Whereas in hot tea, I feel like I put in a little sugar into you know, a mug of hot tea, and sometimes I don't even have to stir it to get it to dissolve. Okay. That has to do with the solubility effect on the temperature. Okay. So for solid solutes like sugar, okay, uh, the solubility is going to increase as the temperature increases. All right, so solid solutes increase the temperature, increase the solubility, meaning you can get more of that sugar to dissolve. Gas solutes are going to have a different effect on this. Solubility is actually going to decrease with an increasing temperature. So some place that you may have experienced this okay, is uh, with any carbonated beverage, so soda, pop, whatever you'd like to call it. Okay. Um, basically, a, your warm pop, kind of the fizziness. Yeah, fizziness is from the uh, carbon dioxide gas solutes dissolved in that solution. Hey, if you've ever opened a warm pop on a, say, a warm day, it tends to fizz more than if you have a very chilled pop. It's part of the reason why whenever you order a pop at, say, a restaurant, they're always going to serve it over ice, because for most people, the reason why you drink pop is to kind of get that, that carbonated fizziness. So to maximize it, you want to get that drink as cold as possible because as long as it's cold, the solubility is high, meaning you can get more carbon dioxide dissolved into your water and other things. So for gas solutes, it has the opposite effect of temperature on the solubility than the solid solutes. Now when we talk about gas solutes, okay, we can talk about temperature. Another uh, factor that affects the solubility of gas solutes is the pressure. Okay, so temperature also affects it. Pressure does as well. So kind of our pressure. And that is an increase of pressure leads to an increase in solubility. So we can say solubility increases with increasing pressure. So this is why Okay, still working with our pop example. This is why pop or your carbonated beverages are pressurized. Okay. 
they can get that pressure increased, the solubility of the carbon dioxide increases, so they can get more carbon dioxide dissolved into that solution, which with carbonated beverages, that's the whole idea, is to get the most amount of carbon dioxide dissolved in there. Okay. So when you open a pop container and you hear that sound, right, either popping the top of a can or if you have a twist top, what's happening there is once you open up that container, you then lower the pressure, okay, because it's pressurized, you lower that pressure down to atmospheric pressure, therefore decreasing the pressure, and it decreases the solubility of that carbon dioxide. If you decrease the solubility of carbon dioxide, okay, those carbon dioxides then can't be dissolved. They want to leave. Their solubility has decreased. They cannot, uh, they can no longer hang out in that solution anymore. So when they leave, once you open that, that sound is the carbon dioxide leaving. So that is how uh, temperature affects our solubility okay, of our solid and our gas solutes. And because gases have multiple uh, properties that we have to look at, pressure will also affect our gas solutes. In the next video, um, we will discuss these solubility rules and what that means for the solubility of our different compounds in water as our solvent.